At the foreign office, Shunichi Matsumoto's long day had not ended. Busy since before dawn, when he and Sakomizu had first translated the radio message from San Francisco, he had manned the foreign office all day while his superior, Togo, fought with friend and foe at the cabinet meeting. Now, in the twilight of August 12, he sat behind a desk thinking of a way in which to give the diplomats more time to patch up their defences. Matsumoto reached for the phone, dialed the telegraph section of the ministry, and spoke to the duty officer. He was explicit in his directions. Watch for any allied messages that come in this evening. If they do, stamp them received as of tomorrow morning. Above all, keep them secret. The duty officer agreed. Matsumoto hung up and sank back into his chair, hoping that his little scheme would give Togo and the other statesmen enough time to reorganise. In this fabricated limbo, the architects of peace might gain the upper hand. Matsumoto went home elated at his deception. At 6.40pm, James Burns's note to the Japanese government was received in the telegraph section by the duty officer. He promptly marked it received as of 7.40am the following day and filed it away. Another message, which came in shortly afterward, further justified Matsumoto's concern over the state of affairs. The telegram was from Suemasa Okamoto, Japanese ambassador to Sweden, who for two days had been trying to gauge Allied reactions to the impending surrender. Okamoto was desperately anxious to alert his countrymen to a grave peril. The Americans' Abe having a hard time harmonizing the opinions of the Allies, Russia and China want the Emperor out, Great Britain advocates temporary recognition of the Emperor. The London Times is against the Emperor system. Okamoto added the obvious warning. Unless Japan accepted the original offer, President Truman might be weaned away from his position. The deadlock in Tokyo must be broken and quickly. At 9.30pm, the Premier of Japan entered Kido's office in answer to an urgent summons. Suzuki listened as the Marquis lectured him on the day's misadventures. Kido minced no words. If we do not accept the Allied position now, we will be sacrificing hundreds of thousands of innocent people to the continued ravages of war. Furthermore, it is His Majesty's wish that we advance on the basis of the views held by his foreign minister. Knowing his man well, Kido concentrated on Suzuki's overriding concern about the Emperor. By allaying the Premier's fears about delivering Hirohito to the enemy, he hoped to dissipate any lingering doubts in Suzuki's mind. Once again, the old admiral promised to stand fast against the opposition, to push through the surrender. Kido saw him to the door and returned to his room convinced that the peace faction was intact for the next crucial hours. While diplomats and generals haggled over the issue of war and peace, Japanese civilians continued to die in clusters. Fires still raged in Nagasaki. On the 12th, disaster teams were still threading through the wreckage looking for survivors. On all sides, they found the dead. Three sailors who entered the city as part of a search team saw buildings along the road smouldering, though not in actual flames. Just over a mile from Ground Zero, many dead lay beside the road. The bodies showed evidence of multiple burns and wounds about the head and extremities. From this distance inward toward the blast center, the number of cadavers increased markedly. These bodies were roasted black. Some of them seemed still alive. Others had swollen grossly, causing their stomachs to rupture onto the ground. There was no foliage anywhere. Everything was covered with a deep brown coating. A putrid, decaying smell clogged the nostrils and made rescuers gag and retch. Survivors were being sent to surrounding towns for treatment. Hundreds of them had been brought to Amura Naval Hospital. The appearance of the patients was horrifying. Their hair was burned, their clothing torn to pieces and stained by blood, and the naked parts of their bodies were all burned and inflamed. Many had jagged pieces of glass and wood driven into their bodies. Few resembled human beings. A strange thing began happening to survivors by the third day after the bomb. They started to die in increasing numbers. After being treated for burns and wounds, the people should have been able to pick up their lives and continue with the task of rebuilding. But instead, they wasted away and became part of the mounting death statistics. Doctors were at a loss to understand the mystery. Both in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, now nearly a week into the atomic age, patients walked into hospitals and died before the disbelieving eyes of physicians and nurses. One officer exclaimed to a companion, 
These cases are entirely different from the injuries which have so far been seen. The patients you treated yesterday have died one after another. The other man was outraged. That's nonsense. But it was not. The patients were not victims of ordinary bombs. They were dosed with gamma rays, which were destroying their insides, and, like a time bomb, preparing to claim them after several days had passed. They exhibited distressing symptoms of diarrhoea and vomiting, lack of appetite and anemia. Their bloodstreams were being ravaged by radiation. As the days went on, more and more survivors fell down and died. The two cities faced a new unseen enemy. While the small fires continued to burn day and night as families disposed of their relatives, the insidious Genshi Bakudansho, the atomic bomb sickness, added fresh corpses to the unending rows about the wastelands, and still the leaders talked on in Tokyo about continuing the war. On the night of the 12th, in Peiping, China, a small group of soldiers tried to make themselves comfortable in the top-floor apartment of a private home. Earlier that day, they had jumped from a plane into a field and then come by truck and train into the walled city on a delicate assignment. Ripping off stolen enemy uniforms, the men quickly mounted a radio aerial on the roof and began sending a coded message back to OSS headquarters at Xi'an. Major Jim Kellis, leader of the team, reported that he and his men were now based in the home of General Meng, commander of Chinese mercenaries working for the Japanese army. Meng had agreed to collaborate with the Americans and had smuggled the OSS agents into the heart of Japanese territory in order that they might be in position to act quickly in case Japan surrendered. Jim Kellis was actually living next door to a building that housed a section of the Japanese general staff in North China. After the message was sent, Kellis ordered the aerial struck. Then he and his men settled down to wait for some word of peace in the Far East. General Anami could not sleep, Aware that his side had been temporarily thwarted by Togo's intervention in the cabinet meeting, he cast about for a new device, a stratagem to block unconditional peace. While the citizens of Tokyo slept on into August 13, the general conferred with aides at his residence. He finally ordered his aide, Colonel Hayashi, to leave on an important errand. The colonel drove to the home of General Umezu and confronted the chief of staff at 4 a.m. Hayashi apologised for waking him then said, It is requested that the Emperor's decision be changed through the efforts of senior members of the army. The Emperor has no confidence in Field Marshal Sugiyama, therefore the War Minister is contemplating having Field Marshal Hata make an appeal to the Emperor. What do you think of that? The question put Umezu in a difficult spot. Clearly, Anami was asking for approval of a device to delay surrender. If Umezu disagreed, the onus of guilt could fall on him. He walked about for a few moments, then turned to Hayashi and said, I'm sorry, I support the acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration. Hayashi rushed back to Anami with these fateful words, and the war minister was shocked into silence. His valued ally Umezu appeared to be deserting him. Anami felt desperately alone as he went to bed for a brief, merciful rest. Within a few hours he was awake and on his way to see the Marquis Kido, who received Anami warmly and ushered him into his study. The two men were old friends. Both had worked for the Emperor as young aides in the household of the Imperial Palace. Kido had no illusions about the General's uncomfortable position in these last days. He fully realised Anami's dual role. First, to win the best possible terms for the Emperor and his army. Second, to keep that army quiet until he accomplished his primary mission, it was the most difficult job Kido could imagine at that moment. Anami opened the conversation by complaining, no self-respecting nation could possibly accept the Allied terms. Kido was ready for this argument and replied, there is no way out. The Japanese have sued for peace. The Americans have given the terms. For Japan now to add conditions to conditions would result in certain rupture of negotiations and a renewed ferocity to the war. Look at it from the American position. What would they think the Japanese were plotting if, at this late stage, they put new rules into the game? If the Emperor changed his mind and rescinded the peace proposal, the Allies would consider him a fool or a lunatic. Anami remained unconvinced. Pessimism never yields good results. We should make one last effort to achieve better terms. Kido said, We must abide by the wishes of His Majesty. We must accept the Allied reply in its present form. Anami started to smile. 
I understand your position very well. I knew you would say something like that. Then he stopped for a brief instant before voicing the thought that nagged at him constantly. But the atmosphere in the army is so tense. He did not elaborate, just rose from the chair and said goodbye to Kido, who gazed sadly after the general as he went out to another appointment. Anami was determined to avoid his young aides as long as possible. So far, Takashita, Aida, Hatanaka and the others had not been able to sit down with him and discuss the coup. Time was slipping by, and yet they could not get the key man to endorse their rebellion. While they fretted at the war ministry, the general went directly to a meeting of the Big Six. There he found the peace faction once more united. A restful sleep had improved Togo's mood and given him a fresh perspective on his duties. Suzuki was chatting amiably with everyone. Puffing on his cherished cigar, he had reversed his previous day's arguments and now resolutely championed the acceptance of the Burns Note and the Potsdam Declaration. Admiral Yonai, whom Anami disliked intensely, maintained his rigid posture in favour of immediate surrender. General Anami and his cohorts, Umezu and Toyoda, clung to their insistence on conditions. Umezu was no longer a diehard, as Anami well knew from the early morning conversation with Hayashi. Yet in public, the gruff chief of staff supported his superior against the diplomats. Anami had little else to feel cheerful about that morning. The Big Six were still hopelessly split. At noon, the group adjourned for lunch and a later cabinet meeting. If Anami had troubles with his own officers, his antagonist in the peace group, Admiral Yonai, was equally distressed by the machinations beneath him at the naval general staff. At noontime on the 13th, the navy minister finally lost his temper. He had been advised that Admiral Toyoda had complained of the Japanese capitulation to the emperor just the day before, and he deeply resented this insubordination. He had also learned that the Vice Chief of Staff, Admiral Onishi, the father of the kamikazes, had spoken disparagingly to various cabinet members about Yonai's own will to fight. If Yonai was annoyed at Toyoda, he was incensed at Onishi, who was engaged in a campaign of character assassination. The Navy Minister fumed for 24 hours and then decided to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the two offenders. As a precaution, Yonai asked his assistant, Admiral Zenshiro Hoshina, to stay as a witness to the encounter. Hoshina was to record significant dialogues and act as a bodyguard in case of any physical danger. Both Yonai and Hoshina feared the volatile Onishi whose reputation for rashness was almost legendary. The warrior was like an unstable element, capable of a violent reaction to a situation. Shortly after noontime, the offenders marched into the Navy Minister's office and saluted. Ramrod straight, caps held in their left hands, the two men waited for some word from their superior. Yonai let them stand in awkward silence. Finally he looked up and spoke sharply. The behaviour of the general staff is execrable. If you have anything to say about me, why don't you come and tell me about it personally? His voice rising, Yonai rushed on. Such an impudent attitude is shameful. Do not do anything like that again. Toyoda never moved a muscle. Onishi bent his head and began to sob. Yonai continued, And what is the idea of recommending momentous decisions to the Emperor without ever consulting me? For my part, I am not meddling with the this and that of what you are doing at the Naval General Staff. To have behaved as you have done is inexcusable. Toyoda remained impassive. Onishi cried loudly, tried to apologize, lost his voice and stopped. Yonai ordered them out. The two admirals marched through the door, one unchastened, the other heartbroken. Yonai and Hoshina were both puzzled and thrilled. Neither had anticipated such a reaction from Onishi. To have cowed such a man, even temporarily, was a signal victory for the peace faction. Yonai went off happily to the afternoon cabinet meeting, which proved far different from the stormy one on the preceding day. Kantaro Suzuki continued to espouse acceptance of the Burns note. No longer did the Premier mouth the words of the war party. The breach in the ranks of the peacemakers had been successfully closed to further exploitation. Foreign Minister Togo, still discouraged by the opposition to his policies, nevertheless was fortified by the change in Suzuki's demeanour. He continued to argue relentlessly with Toyoda, Umezu and Anami, but was able to hold his own temper in check throughout the meeting. For several hours, the two factions sparred for position. For an opening, it was hopeless. 
The same conditions were imposed by the military, the same objections to them raised by the statesmen. Each side had become rigidly committed to its own cause. During a break in the negotiations, General Anami stepped into the next room to call his office at Ichigaya. Standing there waiting for someone to answer, he realistically knew that he could not salvage anything at the conference table. Yet, he had to keep up a pretense to his officers. Anami spoke reassuringly to the man on the other end of the phone. Yes, everything seems to be going our way. They're coming around to my way of thinking. As he hung up, he turned to gaze into the astonished face of Secretary Sakumizu, who was curled up in a chair nearby, catching a few moments of rest. Anami grimaced, then smiled. It's better to let sleeping dogs lie, don't you think? Sakomizu recovered his poise quickly and nodded agreement as he watched the war minister walk back to argue hopelessly against surrender. The secretary was suddenly filled with admiration for the general who was deliberately deceiving his aides. As the rebels on Ichigaya Hill continued to dally, the debate began again in the cabinet room. Suzuki demanded a vote from the full cabinet. Since Toyoda and Umezu did not belong to this body, the premier hoped to isolate Anami. He failed. Though twelve men sided with Togo, two others, the Justice Minister and the Minister for Home Affairs, agreed with Anami. One man could not decide what to do. An impasse had been reached. Suzuki adjourned the meeting with the warning that he would once again seek the advice of the Emperor. As General Anami left the room, he knew that the final hours of the struggle were at hand. When the Emperor spoke again, it would be too late to avert unconditional surrender. In the meantime, he had to face the conspirators gathering around him like jackals. The rebels sought Anami out at his official residence. At 8pm ten of them tried to solicit his final approval of a coup. Takeshita was there. So was Inaba. Hatanaka came with Jiro Shizaki, a longtime friend. Hatanaka brought a rumour of a plot against Anami's life. He and others had heard that peace advocates planned to kill the general if he continued to oppose the Potsdam Declaration. Anami scoffed at this story and turned to talk to another officer, Colonel Okikatsu Arao, senior officer of the military affairs section at the War Ministry. Arao was now a spokesman for the plotters. As such, he was in a most uncomfortable situation. Convinced that Anami would never support a rebellion, Arao nevertheless wanted to maintain the respect of the men working under him. For their part, his subordinates trusted the burly, intelligent colonel, who was a natural leader of men, and therefore an obvious choice to speak for the rank and file. Arao himself believed that Anami had decided months before that the war was hopeless. As far back as the fall of 1944, he had accompanied the general on an inspection tour of the home islands, and heard him say that it was impossible to defend Japan from invasion. In May of 1945, when Anami had ordered the release from prison of Shigeru Yoshida, a friend of the peace faction, Arao had sensed that the general was preparing for the inevitable day of surrender, yet on the evening of August 13 he stood in front of the war minister and spoke of a revolution. The hard-pressed Arao handed Anami a piece of paper, containing the outlines of the projected coup. The general took it, read it quickly, then listened with his eyes closed as Arao elaborated on the details. The rebellion was set for 10 a.m. the following morning. General Mori had already been approached and had promised to think about it. Even if he refused, the coup could proceed because most of his regimental commanders had agreed to act. Marquis Kido and Premier Suzuki would be imprisoned, and the emperor placed in a form of protective custody. The Eastern District Army would be a big stumbling block unless General Tanaka joined the rebels. He would be approached as soon as Anami consented to lend his name to the plot. The fateful moment had arrived. On this man's answer hung the fate of millions. Anami asked, Are you sure that you've thought of everything? It seems to me that your groundwork is a little vague. There are too many things still to be accomplished. He concluded, The plan is very incomplete. Still, he did not say definitely whether he was for or against the basic idea of revolt. The rebels begged for an answer. Anami told Arao to come to his office at midnight to discuss it further. Then he walked with the officers to the front porch. They were both discouraged and optimistic. Anami had not given quick approval as they had hoped, but neither had he flatly rejected their plan. Anami waved them down the stairs and then added a note of caution. 
Be careful, since they may be watching you tonight. Perhaps you had better return in separate groups instead of a single mass. The rebels broke up and left quietly. No one was watching them, but Anami had good reason for saying what he did. Earlier in the week, he had warned both General Mori and the secret police commander, Okido, to be on the lookout for trouble from the ranks. Inside the house, Colonel Hayashi was furious with his superior. By not vetoing the plan, Anami had implicitly encouraged the plotters. When Anami came back in, Hayashi spoke his mind. You've given those men tacit agreement to their plans. You should say no, definitely. It's silly even to talk of a coup because the people won't support it. Anami listened thoughtfully, then shrugged and said, Perhaps you're right. I'll talk again to Arao. Hayashi felt that Anami was letting his men take unfair advantage of him and wanted to protect him from the intrigues. He doubted the war minister's political sense and questioned whether he should therefore even be the war minister. He considered Anami an admirable person, rare among military men, but felt that those same qualities hindered his judgment of officers he liked. Now these officers were taking advantage of the relationship to foster a conspiracy, and Anami did nothing positive to crush the incipient danger. Tojo, Anami's predecessor, would have moved ruthlessly against the rebels. But Anami could not act against his own men, and as a result they would spend the rest of the evening of August 13 making plans for revolt on the next day. An army would have to change his tactics or the explosion would take place on time. At midnight, the general was at his office where Arao joined him. Remembering Hayashi's instructions, An army told Arao that he doubted the coup would succeed. Again, he avoided forbidding the conspirators to proceed with action. After Arao left, Anami went to Hayashi and explained, I told Arao what you said, but I wonder if he will interpret it to mean that I am against the coup. Hayashi murmured, I wonder. By two o'clock on the morning of the 14th, Anami was in bed. The other leading figures in the government crisis were also trying to get some rest before renewing the interminable struggle. Foreign Minister Togo had spent several hours in heated argument with General Umezu and Admiral Toyoda. During their discussion, Admiral Onishi, recovered from his dressing down by Navy Minister Yonai, had burst in and demanded that Japan fight to the very end to the death of all of the inhabitants of the nation. Togo let him ramble on, then flatly rejected his plea. Premier Kantaro Suzuki slept like a drugged man. At 80, he could not keep the pace maintained by Anami and others. His body ached with fatigue. His mind was numbed by the constant strain of debate and intrigue. Within hours, he would have to go once again to the Emperor of Japan for help, and the thought galled him. Somehow Suzuki felt he had failed his majesty and yet he could not think of another way out of the dilemma. August 14 had to bring a climax. In the fading hours of the 13th of August, a radio message had gone out from American naval headquarters in Washington to all units. From the Palaos to Hawaii, from Australia to the fast carriers standing just 150 miles off Honshu, Admiral Ernest King advised, This is a peace warning. All strike forces were cautioned to refrain from attacking the enemy in the next hours. Washington was giving the Japanese a few final hours to get their house in order. Beyond that time, assaults would be renewed. At three o'clock on the morning of the 14th, an American colonel, Ray Pierce, was trying to get some much-needed rest in his quarters in Kunming, China. He was awakened by Colonel Richard Hepner, who had just received a message from Wedemeyer in Chongqing, ordering the OSS to put the Mercy Missions plan into effect. Hepner was not ready and needed help. Piers had compiled an extraordinary record as leader of Detachment 101, a guerrilla outfit in Burma. Now he was assigned to China as Deputy Strategic Services Officer, in charge of clandestine operations south of the Yangtze River. For one month he had been surveying his new command, getting acquainted with the problems associated with it. He never anticipated any like the one now handed him. When Hepner outlined the mission, Piers said, Move the teams up to Xi'an right away. Hepner brought him up short. But we don't have the teams. We have had to use all of our personnel in new operations behind the Japanese lines. So that's the problem. What do you suggest? Piers, a man of action, quickly assumed charge of the project. As dawn broke, he began to screen all available people for the dangerous jumps into Japanese territory. He had very little time left. 
In Tokyo, events moved swiftly on the morning of the 14th. After only three hours' sleep, General Anami breakfasted with Field Marshal Hata, just arrived from Hiroshima, where his headquarters had been destroyed. He had come to report to the government on the effects of the atomic bomb. Hata told Anami that the entire city was gone, that the bomb was inhuman. However, he offered one bit of consolation. He said he believed the weapon was ineffective on anything dug in underground. Since it evidently was exploded in the air, properly entrenched defences could survive unscathed. The harried war minister seized on this remark, telling Hutter, Be sure and mention this to the emperor when you see him. Tell him that the bomb is not so deadly. Anami was grasping at any shred of hope. From this meeting, Anami went to Ichigaya. At 7am his men converged on him. Because Takashita and the others planned to move at 10am, they had to have Anami's guarantee of cooperation within the hour. To speed matters further, they had told Generals Tanaka and Mori to come to Ichigaya that morning for a special conference. By this time the rebels were frantic. The general was prepared for them. Realising that the peace group might move quickly for another Big Six meeting with the Emperor, both he and Umezu had asked that the conference be delayed at least until 1pm. Between now and then he had to thwart the rebels. Almost immediately he made his most important move. He took Colonel Arau down the hall to Umetsu's office. There Anami bluntly asked the general, Will you back a coup? Umetsu sat behind his desk and looked at his friend. Then he turned his gaze on Colonel Arau and said, Absolutely not. There's no chance of it succeeding. For one thing, the people won't follow you. Umezu's voice became scornful. Forty percent of the factory workers have left their jobs already. We could never carry on the war under these conditions. Anami looked at Arau, who could say nothing in the face of such determined opposition. By the time they left the office, the coup was falling apart. Anami, who knew of Umezu's attitude before the meeting, and who was certain there was absolutely no chance of his chief of staff lending aid to the rebels, had led Arao into a baited trap. The colonel went to a telephone to report the bad news to his collaborators. For Arao, the onerous task of acting as spokesman for his colleagues was over. While the coup founded at the war ministry, the peace faction was galvanised into action. Koichi Kido was the catalyst. For several days, the B-29s had waged a campaign of enlightenment as well as destruction over Japan. Millions upon millions of leaflets fell from bomb bays as the 20th Air Force attempted to inform civilians that the war was hopeless. The Americans hoped this cascade of paper would foment public opinion toward insisting that the carnage cease. They reasoned that the government would thus be pressured more quickly into acceptance of the terms of surrender. But the plan, though skillful, was fraught with dangers. If enough troops read the information, if they became aware for the first time of the disastrous turn of events, if they suddenly grasped what was going on in the cabinet meetings in Tokyo, then quite possibly they would take things into their own hands. At 7am, a servant brought Kido a slip of paper that had fallen into his garden. It was an allied leaflet, and it told the whole story. Kido was appalled. A sense of impending disaster rushed over him, and he knew that decisive action must be taken that day before the troops put two and two together. He called the palace and asked for an immediate audience with the emperor. At 8.30, Kido arrived in his presence and broke the news. Hirohito sensed the danger immediately and urged Kido, do whatever you wish to speed the end of this war. Kido suggested calling a last conference of all principles to demand surrender that day. Leaving the library, he met Premier Suzuki, who coincidentally had come at that time to ask for the emperor's help in getting a decision. Kido asked the old man if he had called the Big Six into session. Suzuki looked anguished. I am having a hard time. The army wants me to wait until 1pm while the navy asks me to postpone it without setting a specific time. Suzuki seemed at a loss as to what to do next, yet he made an unusual request and asked Kido if it would be possible for them to meet jointly with the emperor and settle basic strategy for the day. Holding a dual audience with the ruler was almost never done, but these were extraordinary times, and Kido knew the Emperor would agree. They met with him at ten o'clock. Out of the meeting came a surprising tactic, which threw the other members of the cabinet into a frenzied haste and caught the war party completely off guard. 
Emperor Hirohito sent out a summons for his cabinet ministers to meet with him at 10.30 in less than half an hour. The message caused absolute chaos. All over Tokyo, officials put down telephones and frantically rushed about to dress in proper attire. On this unusual occasion, they were not required to wear formal clothes. Nevertheless, the resulting confusion in offices verged on the hysterical. Private secretaries lost their ties, shirts were exchanged, collars were closed by men trying to look more presentable before their emperor. By car, they converged on the palace for a momentous confrontation. They gathered in the library, a one-story building. They had entered it through an air raid shelter in the entrance hall, and now made their way to a flight of stairs leading to the underground conference room. Single file, the elite of the Japanese government walked down the wet, mat-lined steps between walls dripping with moisture. At the bottom of the stairway, they turned right and walked to an open door, twelve inches thick. Beyond it was the council room where eleven of them had met with the emperor on the night of August 9th. The air was clammy as they seated themselves in two rows of chairs in front of the familiar narrow table, now covered with a beautiful gold brocade cloth. Beyond the table was a solitary chair, straight-backed with arms on both sides. Behind the chair was a six-fold gilded screen. Other than these furnishings, the room was starkly bare. Twenty-four people sat waiting for the Emperor of Japan. In the front row were Yonai, Suzuki, Togo, Umezu, Toyoda and Anami. Surrounding them were assistants and secretaries. Baron Hiranuma was in attendance. So was Secretary Sakomizu, who was terrified. In his superior's hands lay the power to bring off this meeting. It was up to Premier Suzuki to guide the conversation and circumvent any opposition. Sakomizu feared that the old man would fail badly. For days, Sakomizu had worried about Suzuki, and his fears seemed to be justified. The Premier had not been able to force through the Emperor's initial surrender request of the 9th. At eight o'clock on this very morning, Sakomizu had gone to Suzuki to ask if he had prepared a proclamation for the Emperor to read at the Cabinet meeting. Suzuki had no idea that he should have written one. Sakomizu was furious. He became even more incensed when Suzuki told him that he did not even have a speech prepared in case the Emperor called a meeting that day. Now, at 10.30, Sakomizu felt his worst premonitions were about to be confirmed. The old man was sure to botch the whole plan. At the most important hour in his life, he would fumble his way through the agenda and lose the initiative so carefully built up these past days. An eerie quiet prevailed, broken once or twice by nervous coughs. Anami sat in full military uniform, staring impassively at the door beside the gold screen. At 10.50 it opened and the ruler of the Japanese Empire walked into the room, he was dressed in a military uniform. He wore white gloves. Hirohito moved to the simple wooden chair and sat down. His audience rose and bowed as he came in. Now they sat down and waited. Suzuki was the first to speak. The aged premier rose and faced Hirohito. After apologising for calling upon him once more for guidance, Suzuki launched into a recital of the difficulties which had brought the cabinet to an impasse. In the back row, Sakomizu listened. His sweating palms betrayed his intense excitement as he heard the eighty-year-old warrior seize the reins of leadership and forcefully lead the discussion. There was no doubt that the Premier was in complete command of the situation in this crowded room. Suzuki spoke without notes, yet his presentation was cogent and compelling. After outlining the problem, he turned to the generals and admirals and asked them to state their arguments once more. Anami and Umezu were so choked with emotion that their speeches were only confused and ineffective. It remained for Admiral Toyoda, the man without a fleet, to defend the war party against its detractors. He spoke brilliantly. Toyoda stood before his emperor and his peers and launched a last defence of the Japanese military. His points were the old ones. The emperor's sovereignty must be maintained. Japan must not be occupied. The clause referring to the government eventually being determined by the free will of the people is most dangerous and will undermine the entire Japanese tradition. Having argued his faction's position better than anyone in the room, he sat down. Feet shuffled and twenty-four men waited for the next move. Suzuki asked the emperor to speak. Hirohito leaned slightly forward in his chair and began, If there are no further views to present, I will present mine. I would like to have all of you agree with me. 
My view is still unchanged from that which I expressed at the conference on the 9th. The Emperor was already having difficulty speaking. He began to sob out phrases, to pause and control his voice, then to continue. Everyone was visibly affected. Men started to sob quietly. I have studied the terms of the Allied reply and have concluded that they constitute a virtually complete acknowledgement of the position we maintained in the note dispatched several days ago. In short, I consider the reply to be acceptable. At this point, the Emperor broke down. His gloved right hand moved up under his glasses and wiped his tear-filled eyes. Then he continued, I appreciate how difficult it will be for the officers and men of the army and navy to surrender their arms to the enemy and to see their homeland occupied. Indeed, it is difficult for me to issue the order making this necessary and to deliver so many of my trusted servants into the hands of the Allied authorities by whom they will be accused of being war criminals. In spite of these feelings, I cannot endure the thought of letting my people suffer any longer. Hirohito was almost incapable of further speech. His chest heaved as he struggled to finish. In the hot room, tears mingled with sweat on many faces. The Emperor concluded, It is my desire that you, my ministers of state, accede to my wishes, and forthwith accept the Allied reply. In order that the people may know of my decision, I request you to prepare at once an imperial rescript so that I may broadcast to the nation. I am afraid that members of the armed forces will be particularly disturbed. If requested by the war and navy ministers, I will be willing to go anywhere to talk personally with the troops. It matters not what happens to me, but I wonder how I can answer the spirits of the ancestors if the nation is reduced to ashes with great sacrifice of life. Therefore, as the Emperor Meiji once endured the unendurable, so shall I, and so must you. If there is anything more that should be done, I will do it. If I should have to stand before a microphone, I will do so willingly. Finally, I call upon each and every one of you to exert himself to the utmost, so that we may meet the trying days which lie ahead. He stopped suddenly, groping in vain for more words. In the silence, all knew that the war was really over. It was done. Prime Minister Suzuki slowly approached the Emperor, bowed deeply and humbly apologised. Hirohito rose slowly and walked back through the door he had entered less than an hour ago. He had delivered his nation to the enemy. Few of his audience saw him go. Instead of rising to bow before the Emperor, most sat crying into their hands. Two men slid onto the floor. On elbows and knees they cried uncontrollably. The tiny room was filled with sorrow as grown men expressed their grief. Rivals sobbed beside each other. Enemies comforted each other. Japan had lost its honour. One by one, the bereaved filed up the long stairway into the bright sunlight. Only they knew the tragic truth. No one else in the country was aware of it. Now came the most awesome task, delivering Japan to the enemy without inciting the military, which might go wild at the news. Anami, however, was still plagued by his conscience. Had he done Inoue country's strength and possibly make the enemy pause and reconsider the terms? As the conference broke up, he asked his secretary, Hayashi, to follow him into the bathroom. There he spoke plaintively. There is one last piece of advice I want to ask of you. The imperial decision has been issued, but according to intelligence sources, there is a large American convoy outside of Tokyo. What do you think of the idea of proposing peace after striking the convoy? Hayashi was dismayed at this thinking, and immediately said, Your idea is absolutely mistaken. In the first place, the imperial decision to terminate the war has been issued, and in the second place, even though there is a rumour of a large American convoy south of Tokyo Bay, there has been no confirmed report from the air patrol units. Therefore it is a mistake to think of such a thing. Anami protested no more. In fact, he seemed to want this response from Hayashi. He wanted to be told that he had done his best, that there was nothing left to do. Even as he got solace from Hayashi, the general's brother-in-law Takashita was on his way to him with more talk of rebellion. Anami and the others went directly to a last cabinet meeting. The members met to formally ratify the emperor's request. There was no more opposition. Anami, Umezu and Toyoda seemed almost relieved to have the issue decided. No one protested. After the abortive interview with Umezu that morning, Colonel Arau had told his friends that the coup appeared hopeless and it had been put off indefinitely. Then, later that morning, 
Two subordinates of Takeshita went to Umezu's office to plead one last time. The general was a harried man that day. Not wanting to be unkind to the officers, he merely tried to point out the practical side of the matter. I am not absolutely opposed to the idea of a coup. However, you men must realize that it has no chance of succeeding. Yet the two officers went away under the delusion that Umezu would back them if they could somehow pull off the rebellion. This information went the rounds in the ministry, and once more extremists dusted off the operational plan for seizure of power in Tokyo. Before noon, news of the impromptu imperial conference with the cabinet had reached the ministry. Shortly thereafter, Takashita headed across town to Suzuki's official residence. He found the war minister in an anteroom off the main conference room. The cabinet had just adjourned after approving the emperor's decision. Takashita came right to the point. The men still want to follow you, and now we think Umezu will go along with us. Will you reconsider? Anami quickly shook his head. No, I will not. It is too late. The decision has been made in the other room. Takeshita gasped at this news. Then resign your position, and that will make the emperor's action worthless. Normally in Japan, if the full cabinet did not agree, an imperial rescript was invalid, and if Anami quit, the cabinet would automatically dissolve. Anami appeared to hesitate, then said, Yes, that might be a solution. Get me some paper. He walked around the room. Takashita waited for his next remarks. Anami came back to him and shook his head. No, it's too late for that. I'm going back to the ministry and tell the men the news. He put on his hat and walked out to his car in the driveway. Takashita, now convinced that the war really was over, followed him to the ministry building. The Ichigaya Heights headquarters was the scene of a strange mixture of emotions by the time General Anami arrived there. Word of the impending surrender had seeped out to field grade officers and their reactions were predictable. Most of them sat crying or staring at the walls of their offices. Some shouted noisily through the corridors that the war should go on. In some offices, papers were pulled out of the cabinets and burned as men prepared for the day of the enemy's arrival. In his office, the vice chief of staff, Toroshiro Kawabe, pondered a brazen move. A die-hard militarist to the end, Kawabe believed right up to this day that the army should fight on the beaches. But now he realized that further opposition was senseless, and he wanted only to make sure that the surrender would be carried out according to plan. He knew that the highest-ranking officers in the army were gathered in another room on the same floor, and wondered if he ought to seal the bargain by asking them to sign a pledge of allegiance to the rescript terminating the war. To that end, he composed a simple document. The army will act in accordance with the imperial decision to the last. He walked to the room with Vice Minister of War Wakamatsu, who had seconded his plan. Just outside the conference room, the two waited to be called into the presence of the elite in the Imperial Japanese Army. Inside, sitting around a table, were Umezu, stolid, scowling, finally convinced that the right thing had been done that morning. Doihara, who had helped begin the ill-fated adventure years before in Manchuria, and had become the first Japanese mayor of Mukden, Hata, whose headquarters in Hiroshima had disappeared just eight days before, and Sugiyama, the field marshal, just a spectator in these recent hectic days. The two went in to present their paper, which was intended merely to guarantee that no leader would have second thoughts about the emperor's decision and break away from the majority. When Toroshiro Kawabe told the generals what he wanted, he did so with some fear that they would take offence at his obvious insinuation, but the fight had gone out of them, and they no longer wanted to carry the burden. Umezu signed quickly, and one by one the others affixed their signatures to the simple document. General Anami walked in at the last moment, looked at the paper, and signed it without a murmur. At two o'clock in the afternoon, section leaders and field officers crowded into conference room number one, where Anami stood morosely behind a desk. Visibly affected as he asked for quiet, the war minister then spoke to the hushed group. A meeting has just been held in the imperial presence, and His Majesty has rendered his final decision in favour of terminating the war. The imperial army must act in complete accord with this decision. Japan will henceforth face difficult times, even though you may have to sleep on the ground and eat stones. I ask you, one and all, to do your utmost to preserve the national polity. Anami had spelled it out with brutal clarity. 
The rebels were too late. The decision had been rendered. Forget the revolt. The general had ended his show of paternal interest in the plans of his aides. Now he was telling them to stop the nonsense once and for all. Hatanaka uttered a mournful wail and burst into tears. Colonel Ida looked accusingly at the war minister and said, Why have you lost your resolve? Anami closed his eyes and seemed to be exerting great effort to control his emotions. Then he answered, I could not refuse the emperor any longer, especially when he asked in tears to bear the pain no matter how trying it might be. I could not but forget everything and accept it. He gazed at his subordinates in an attempt to get their understanding. Angry men left conference room number one and vowed that it was not too late, that they would prove Anami wrong. The coup would succeed without him. One of the dissidents was Kenji Hatanaka, Anami's protégé. Almost immediately he set out on a bicycle for the headquarters of the Eastern District Army, a key group to the success of a revolt. As this desperate young man went about his chores, the rest of the world was becoming aware that the deadlock in the cabinet had been broken. A radio operator on Okinawa wrote down a radio message beamed in English from Tokyo by Dome News Agency at 2.49pm. Flash Flash Tokyo, August 14. It is learned that an imperial message accepting the Potsdam Proclamation is forthcoming soon. The message did not come as the day passed, but the United States knew that the end was near and issued instructions accordingly. On Okinawa, units of the 11th Airborne Division continued landing. On August 11, they had been alerted in the Philippines to move out immediately for the Ryukyus. From Lipa Airfield in northern Luzon, planes flew northwest in a continuous stream toward Yontan and Kadena airports on Okinawa. By now, most of the division was bivouacked on the island. All units were advised that Japan was the next stop. In the Pacific Ocean, Halsey's heaving warships still prowled off the shores of Honshu and Shikoku. An airstrike was held up as planes loaded bombs on the flight deck. In base headquarters at Opama Airfield, south of Tokyo, Japanese fighter pilots gathered at the summons of their commandant. The officer appeared to be ill, as he stood shakily before them using his desk as support. None of the pilots was prepared for what he told them. The surrender orders may be announced at any moment. Order must be maintained at this base. There may be hotheads who will refuse to accept the decision to surrender. Remember, and never forget it, His Majesty's orders come before anything else. The men were absolutely stunned. Though they knew the war was tearing Japan apart, they had not expected the end to come in this way on this day. The pilots went out the door and across the field in shock, disbelieving and yet knowing the awful truth. On Tinian, far to the south, B-29s again were being loaded for another night of destruction over the home islands, against the possibility that the Japanese would not surrender. Two cities were marked for firebombing that night, the night of the 14th. The Americans were taking no chances on letting the Japanese reconsider. Soviet tank columns slashed across the flat plains of Manchuria against increasingly disorganized resistance as the Soviets rushed to acquire real estate and put in claims for post-war rights. At Xi'an on the edge of the Gobi Desert, Gus Krauss was alerted to expect 36 OSS men bound on a special mission. He had no idea what they intended to do. Krauss had problems of his own. He sent a telegram to Kunming outlining the latest intelligence estimates from his own men in the field. He knew that the Japanese were about to collapse. He also knew something else, something that promised to shatter all dreams of peace in the Far East. Now appears all field teams face conflict with communists in trying to carry out orders to occupy cities on Jap surrender and seize records. Teams in pockets say Red's bar entrance into Hankou, Pengpu and Suchow. Leopard faces Red's on way to Taiwan. Kellis finds some Red's near Peeping. Lion has tangled with Red's. Hound reported 100,000 Red's near his area. Request instructions on what action teams should take. Suggest that if teams must fight Reds to carry out orders, they be withdrawn to Hatsayan. Sincerely feel teams should not risk their lives in conflict with Reds. Feeling in North China is civil war will start immediately after Jap capitulation. Please advise soonest. In Tokyo, Kenji Hatanaka arrived at Eastern Army District Headquarters. He went to General Seiichi Tanaka's office to ask the general for his support in an uprising. 
Tanaka listened to the young major as he expounded on the necessity for action. The government and the military leaders have decided to terminate the war, a decision which I cannot accept as things stand now. My idea is that we should establish ourselves within the palace, sever communications with the outside, and give assistance to the Emperor in a final effort to retrieve the situation. I have already gotten in touch with the Imperial Guards Division and have made the necessary arrangements. I would like you to take part in the plan. Tanaka was aghast. He thundered at Hatanaka. Go back to your barracks and stop this ridiculous scheme. Do what you're told and accept what your leaders say. The war is over. Hatanaka stormed out of the office and went ahead with his next step. Shortly after four o'clock, he appeared at the room of Lieutenant Colonel Masataka Aida, another of Anami's protégé. Hatanaka and Aida were close friends. Aida was the weaker of the two, the more easily moved. Hatanaka counted on this fact. He repeated the speech he had given earlier to Tanaka, but Aida had changed his mind about the coup and turned him down flat. He declared it was too late for such an adventure. Hatanaka took it surprisingly well. All right, I'll do my best and leave the rest to Providence. They parted cordially. The Major kept raking over the ashes of the fire of rebellion. It looked impossible to get any cooperation as the actual surrender neared, but he was persistent. Convinced that rebellion was no longer a major threat, the Kempe Tai secret police relaxed their guard. Since Takashita, Aida and other senior officers appeared to have lost heart, Colonel Chukamoto and his superiors paid little attention to Kenji Hatanaka as he frantically sought support. Early on the evening of the 14th, Major Kenji Hatanaka's search for supporters brought success. Jiro Shizaki, a colleague at the ministry, had always supported him. Another who finally agreed to participate was Major Hidemasa Koga, the son-in-law and next-door neighbour of the deposed Premier Hideki Tojo. Father of an 11-month-old boy, he now served in the Imperial Guards Division, which protected the Emperor. For the past two months, Koga had worked long days constructing a new air raid shelter for the Imperial family. When it was finished, the young Major stood at a personal crossroads. Because of the pending coup, he was torn between his friendships with other officers and concern about his own family. On the afternoon of the 13th, the handsome cavalry officer had gone to Tojo's home to see his family. Mrs. Tojo saw him ride up on a motorcycle and run to the door. He burst in and went to the general's study at the left of the entrance hall. Since General Tojo was occupied with a guest, Koga went on into the back of the house where his wife and child waited. He scooped the baby up in his arms and asked his wife to follow him into the family air raid shelter. There he spoke urgently. I want you to go to Kyushu with the baby. You'll be safer there with my family. His wife listened quietly as he added forcefully, I want you to go as soon as possible. He held the baby close, then put him down. Moving to his wife, he asked, Do you have my hair and nail clippings? She was startled because in Japan, these things are left to relatives by the dead. When she nodded, he continued, There are times when one must do one's duty. I can't avoid the troubles ahead. He embraced her and quickly broke away. On the way to the front door, Mrs. Tojo appeared with a box of sweets. Thanking her, he looked into Tojo's study once more. Seeing the general still engaged, Koga merely waved and hurried out the door. He had been home only ten minutes. When General Tojo came out of his study, he knew from the stricken faces of his wife and daughter that his son-in-law was in trouble. His wife asked him to talk to Koga before he got into bad trouble. Not aware of what was happening at the war ministry, Tojo decided to go there and find out the reason for Koga's strange actions. He called for a car and went off to Ichigaya. When he returned at about nine o'clock that night, he seemed pleased. After officers had briefed him on the general situation, he had found Koga and talked persuasively to him about the future. He warned him to think carefully before involving himself in a coup. The son-in-law promised to stay calm, and Tojo left feeling that Koga would behave. He was wrong. Other forces were also working on the youthful patriot. Under extreme pressure from fellow officers at the palace, Koga joined the revolt. Major Hatanaka had been talking to officers in the Imperial Guards Division for several days. He sensed that they would be sure to follow him if he could prevail on the commanding general, Mori, to cast his lot with the rebels. 
Though Mori had so far resisted all overtures, Hatanaka planned one last appeal to him. He definitely could count on Jiro Shizaki and Koga. Other officers in the guards' division were easily swayed. Hatanaka felt encouraged enough to proceed. He got on the phone and began calling conspirators into action. Later, at ten o'clock that evening, he and Jiro Shizaki went to see Colonel Ida in his bedroom at the War Ministry, in the hope of persuading that vacillating officer to help his friends. Ida was morose, brooding over the past day's events. He had decided to commit suicide. Earlier, he had gone around to his co-workers at the Ministry, urging them to do likewise. Now he lay in bed, staring into space. Hatanaka burst in upon his reverie. Ida, all the members of the Imperial Guards have agreed with us except General Mori. Koga is too young to persuade him, so come and talk to him. Ida sat up straight. He thought for a moment and then asked, What will you do if I can't convince him, I mean, if he doesn't agree with us? What will you do then? If Mori doesn't agree with us, I'll give up the coup, but we should at least try. Ida was torn. His friendship with Hatanaka went back several years, and he was very fond of the ascetic-looking officer. They had spent much time together during the war, and had even joined in discussion groups under a certain Professor Haraizumi, a man of great influence on the younger element at the war ministry. Haraizumi preached on the nature of the emperor system and on the obligations of the military in fostering and nurturing that way of life. He felt it was the sworn duty of the officers to uphold the emperor, and to carry out imperial orders unhesitatingly. Now Hatanaka was asking Ida to upset the expressed wishes of the Emperor. The rationale was simple. Because men around Hirohito had forced his hand, the younger officers were only seeking to rid the government of this subversive group. If the Emperor had been beguiled by men like Kido and Suzuki, the military did not have to honour a proclamation from the throne. It made sense to Hatanaka and his followers, and now they wanted Ida to come with them. Colonel Ida excused himself and went out to talk with others in the war ministry. When he came back, he tried to reason with Hatanaka. It's difficult to convince even our group of friends around here. It will be more difficult to persuade General Mori. He repeated his first question. In that case, what will you do? Shizaki broke in. I'm sure God will help us. We must attempt a coup. Hatanaka added, If Mori doesn't agree with us, I'll kill him. Ida was shocked. His fears rising, he then asked about General Tanaka, another in the group of generals the rebels needed. Hatanaka airily dismissed this issue. It's not positive yet, but if the Imperial Guards Division goes, all of the army will follow us. Of that I'm sure. Ida instinctively felt the danger of the situation, but he did not want to desert his old friend. Though he knew that the coup was beginning on forlorn hopes, he gave in and agreed to go to General Mori. Hatanaka smiled happily as the two shook hands. The one man who held the absolute power to make any coup succeed was involved at this time in drafting the Emperor's speech to the people, to be given on the following day. Closeted with the cabinet, General Anami was engaged in a running verbal battle to soften the language of the declaration. Even at the end of the war, Anami was trying desperately to salvage the reputation of his army, to shift the blame for the country's defeat away from his men. His overriding concern was for the Emperor's safety, but as the last moments of the struggle approached, he was determined to word the proclamation so that the stigma would not fall on the army. When the cabinet discussions were finally over late in the evening, Anami was tired and utterly despondent. Burdened with a general's grief at surrendering his forces, at turning over his country to the enemy, he went to say goodbye to a man he deeply admired, Admiral Suzuki. Dressed in his braided and bemedalled uniform and wearing white gloves, Anami carried a box of cigars to the old man. He presented this gift and said, I should have given you every assistance in this war, but I'm afraid I have caused you a great deal of trouble instead. Suzuki immediately grabbed the general's hand, and the two leaders stood looking at each other for a long moment. The Premier realised that Anami was offering his friendship and was deeply moved by the gesture. I fully appreciate your painful position, the old man said. I have not yet lost hope for the future of Japan. Anami agreed with that thought, then bowed and walked from the room. 
Tearfully, Suzuki watched the door close. The war minister left for his official residence near the centre of the city. His public life was ended. The formalities had been concluded, and he could lay down his sword and title. When Anami reached home, his servants noticed his sombre mood. He went straight to his first-floor bedroom and ordered some sake wine and cheese brought in. Stripping off his coat, he sat down on a tatami mat and wrote with a brush on a large sheet of paper. The room was quiet, the atmosphere tranquil. Outside the house, the air was sultry, the streets empty. 